big news, big picture news, not only the, the stadium renderings unveiling, but finding out that Ted Phillips is going to be stepping down and moving on. Does uh, w- What are the, the ramifications right now for this team? Well, I mean, it just sends the franchise potentially in a, in a different direction in terms of who has that role. Um, I know my colleague Dan Pompey in his story mentioned a couple uh, in-house candidates. Uh, you know, there, you know, there's there's a lot of reason to think the Chicago Bears, being the Chicago Bears, would would do that. Um, and you know, I, I think of the intriguing possibilities are could you know, uh, there's a lot of intriguing possibilities outside the building, and, and what that could mean, and what is going to be the primary responsibility of this person. Then obviously, so much going into the new stadium and, and all that. So. It's, uh, yeah, it's big news. I think you, you talk to people around the league and this is not the most surprising news. Um, and I think you could kind of see the way Ted Phil's role was changing as of January. Um, but yeah, it, it could be down the road once we find out who that new president is, it can mean a lot for the direction of this franchise. For people who kind of see Ted Phillips as a bit of a cipher or a punching bag, from your perspective of covering this team for as long as you have, what has been his value to the Bears slash McCaskey family? Well, Lawrence, you can make the argument he's been the punching bag to defend the McCaskey family, right? Like you, yep. can, you can certainly say that, that Ted Phillips took a lot of hits for decisions ultimately that come down to uh, a McCaskey who is above him in the, in the uh, flow chart. Um, you know, they're... I think if you look, just isolate what Ted Phillips' main job was, which was the business of the Bears, the business of the Bears is absolutely booming. Um, if you want to be cynical, you could say, well, it's the it's an NFL team. How could their business not be booming? But there's obviously a lot of things that have gone on behind the scenes, in front of the scenes, that we've seen that Ted Phillips has had his fingerprints on that have been very important to where the Bears are financially. You talk about the value of this team. You talk about the new stadium. You talk about New House Hall. Um, all those things you can you can go back to Ted Phillips. You want to talk football? Uh, you know, th- there there's a lot of negative that you could say about this team, and you can mention the fact that Ted Phillips has been part of the process of choosing general managers and choosing head coaches, and giant moves have come across his desk before they have been made. Um, but you know, look, Ted Phillips gave a very quick thumbs up, go ahead and do it when the Khalil Mack trade became a possibility. Uh, I think Ted Phillips was, we we know he was all on board with the Justin Fields trade-up, things like that. So you can go back and forth through the years. Certainly, I'm sure you can find out possible situations which Ted Phillips might have quote-unquote meddled or or maybe been a hindrance to a certain move. But I think at least, like I joined the beat in 2013 and and you guys know I grew up around here. So I certainly knew a lot about the franchise. You know, in my 10 years here, I, I didn't hear stories about um, you know, well, the Bears couldn't do this because of Ted Phillips. It was generally the opposite. But I also will note that I've been on this beat for 10 years and the Bears have won zero playoff games in that time. And there's been one person who's been the president for a very long time. So if you want to talk about kind of the football structure, um, there's reason to think, hey, you know, it, it's possibly time for a change when you're talking about trying to get a winning product on the field. What does his departure do relative to the timetable for a potential sale of the team? Does it augur the possibility? Does it catalyze the possibility? That's a good question, Dan. And you're also going to get into a lot of family dynamics when you talk about the potential sale of this team. And and you get you can get really into the weeds there too. And there's going to be a lot of Stuff that, that comes, you know, there's just, there's a lot of politics involved. Um, I, I don't, like, whatever comes next for this team, I don't know how clean it's going to be. But I do think that George McCaskey is very calculated, as is Ted Phillips. I'm sure they've discussed a lot of things about where this franchise is going. They've talked through a lot of hypotheticals, a lot of scenarios. Um, you know, I, I'm sure fans can sit there and not trust whatever plans are in place for what's going to happen in the future. But I would imagine that they're they're ready for a lot of different things that could happen. Uh, and Ted Phillips, I'm sure, has you know given his voice and that, that voice is always going to be there for George McCassie to kind of lean on. Like George trusts Ted Phillips unconditionally. And and that has maybe been for the better or for the worse at times with this team. Um, but it's, it's a relationship that goes back a long way. And, and whatever the Bears do down the line, 
certainly Ted Phillips won't have an official role, um, but they mentioned, you know, th there's a consulting role possibility and, and he's going to be, you know, he, his voice is going to be there. Like you're, there's going to be kind of a Ted Phillips impact and whatever happens with this franchise moving forward with a lot of, again, again, the possibility of a lot of big changes. What do you think the significance is of the Bears saying, hey, come on out to our rendering for this new thing that we're going to build in Arlington Heights? Well, Lawrence, it could be some goodwill, right? Come look at this really cool thing that we're going to plop in your neighborhood. Um, and, you know, obviously there's going to be some financial questions that will follow um, in the months and years ahead. Uh, so I, I think that they want to be able to prove that if they're going to be building this thing, that they're going to be good community members. And this is going to be something that is going to be good for the Arlington Heights community and the surrounding suburbs. And, you know, they're also going to want to put on a show for people who live in Chicago and people who are Bears fans who are going to look at those renderings and say, wow, I get it. I get why they're moving. I get why they want to do this. That looks awesome. And I'm excited to you know, take my family to whatever it is going to be around that, not just a stadium, but around the stadium. Or I want to take my family to other events that are going to be there. So I think it's going to be, you know, so much of this stuff is PR, right? You can certainly see the, that angle in some of the stuff that came out from the city of Chicago recently. And I think this is now the bear's turn um, to say, well, look what we're planning to build if all goes well here. So I imagine it's just, you know, there is, some logistics to it of they want to make sure that everybody understands what they're trying to do. But I also imagine they're trying to earn some points and, and say, look at this really cool, shiny, giant stadium and the things around it that you're going to want to come to and bring your families to for years and decades to come. How can the Bears take a, a successful preseason just based on wins and losses, whatever they think that means, and make it matter going into the season without being silly or stupid about it? Yeah, Dan, it's it's a good question because I think you and I might be a little similar in things that make us roll our eyes. Um, and like you watch the way that they were running everywhere on the field in those games, running to the ball and running to help people up. And, and for them to win those games and for them to put up the defensive performances they did, for them to not have the penalties, for them to not turn the ball over, all those things are all about what Matty Berfus wants to show you know, now Eberfus can put that on tape and say, hey, we won those games and you guys did everything we've been asking you to do. Now, there's an argument to be made that those things might have happened irregardless of, you know, excuse me, regardless of the the hits philosophy. But I do think that, that for the coaching staff standpoint, there is a confidence that they can instill. It said, hey, look what we did to the Cleveland Browns with a bunch of starters in the field in their stadium because you guys – our understanding buying into not just the schemes, but this whole philosophy that we're doing. And that's going to help us, you know, win close games down the line. So I do think for the players to see that, I do think that that can help, um, especially when they're going to be in some close games, I, I you know, in the season. I think that that's going to, you know, I don't know if that's going to help them win games because ultimately it's going to come down to the talent and they're going to be lacking in that in almost every game this season. Uh, but I, I think that there's something tangible about being able to see the wins. I don't know if you guys have been watching Hard Knocks, but yes, it, it's a <laughs> yes, I have. Of course, I have. Yeah, it's a reminder watching it that like the coaches really care about winning these preseason games. I know. Well, he does. Yeah, he yes, he does. But like in the fourth quarter, like they're trying to win, and maybe this, maybe the. Some teams aren't like this. Maybe I don't know if New England is like this, or some teams that just have they win enough in the regular season where it he doesn't was matter. almost in tears when they lost. He's all <laughs> red in the face. It, it seriously like it, it was life and death out there to Dan Campbell. Yeah, and the reason I bring that up is like the Bears are trying to win these preseason games. So you know maybe for the coaches to say, hey, we tried, we like we wanted to do this, we executed, we won. Look at us. Maybe the players are like, huh. Maybe this thing is working. So again, I don't know if all of that will really translate to wins and losses when the, when the season is go, uh, undergoing and and you've got like these teams throwing defenses at Justin Fields and you got teams with great quarterbacks going against a very young and inexperienced brand new scheme on defense. But you know, for just looking at the here and now, I can see why it can matter once the the games begin. What do you think you learned about Justin Fields in this preseason? I would have had a. Like, I guess I would have had a lot different answer to that with like 14 minutes to go in the first quarter. 
uh, against Cleveland. But like, I, I mean, I was legitimately impressed with what I saw in the next three, and obviously those next uh, four possessions when they had three scores. Um, I, I, I'm so much more buying into. I feel like I'm, I'm so much more buying into Luke Getzey right now, maybe more so than I am buying into Justin Fields. And I'm seeing this scheme, and you're kind of nodding along, like, I get it. Okay, yes, if you get him rolling this way, he's so comfortable on the move. He's got the powerful arm. He can make plays with his legs. Look at the way the wide receiver. I mean, I, guys, how, did, I saw more wide receivers and tight ends open against Cleveland than I did in, like, half the regular season games last year. And there's something to creating these, you know, layups scheming guys open that's what we were told was going to happen before it's now we actually con- saw it it's a novel concept dan and i hear that i hear that it works uh, when, when you do it right so i think that that stuff matters so like i i think justin fields like it's gonna be hard until the games begin to really know has he elevated the way that he can read defenses and adjust things if you go back to the tajay sharp throwing the first game i thought that was a great example he saw the blitz, he made the call, he makes a single to sharp, and then shows the physical gifts to make that throw. All right, that was a good that was good to see that. So now what's gonna happen when it's San Francisco's really good defense? How is he going to adjust in game, pre-snap, all those things? But I keep coming back to this the scheme, and I also come back to the fact that he hasn't been erratic. Like I think he's been pretty accurate and I saw that a lot in camp. And he's he's protected the football pretty well. So all those things I think are positive. It's just I'm trying really hard, guys, not to like look at those, that stat line and be like, oh my God, it's Joe Burrow 2.0. Here we go. Right? Because like we just know that that's not the case and we just need to see more tests. But I, I like, I really like the way this scheme is, is really fitting what Justin Fields does well. Okay. So that's good when it comes to the, the, the offense of this team. Do you think that, that what they've put together as an offensive line can protect him? That, Lawrence, I don't know. Like, I know that they, like, you can sit there and say, okay, Braxton Fields, what a great story. He's a fifth-round pick, and now he's going to be a starter at left tackle. You guys have probably seen the numbers of how few rookies, day three rookies, have started at left tackle. Let let alone fifth round, let alone from a team that went one One in ten, whatever they were. Exactly. So... There's that. Then you go Tevin Jenkins. Oh, the story of training camp, right? Going from third team to trade block to mysterious injury, starting right guard. Well, okay. So like you're you're going into against the San Francisco defensive line with a guy who's hasn't played guard in a real game since what his sophomore year at Oklahoma State. Again, you can go down the line with these guys. So you can tell yourself, hey, they're really impressed with Larry Borm. The the previous staff saw a lot of good things from Larry Borm. Maybe the Bears have something here, but it's also like again fifth round pick um lucas patrick this is someone that they like they would probably tell you he was their number one free agent signing the guy hasn't been the guy's been hurt he missed all of camp except for two practices and he was a backup in green bay so you get like every player you can you can play both sides of the coin and and because of that i just don't have that confidence in that offensive line at least early on is going to be good enough, which is why you need to rely on Getz's scheme. You're going to need to rely on the run game. You're going to need to rely on Justin Fields' legs. Because, yeah, you can sit there and tell me everything that Ryan Poles and Ian Cunningham probably want to tell me, which is, hey, we've got something in Braxton Jones. What a revelation in Tevin Jenkins. Wait till you see Lucas Patrick. You know, we've got something in Larry Borum. But I can then counter that with a lot of things I just said and say, well, I'm not sure. Like, if you just go left to right, those five guys who are going to start on the offensive line, it's probably, you know, quote unquote, talent wise, the 30th ranked. I mean, I, I don't even know, I, you know, what, like, how, I think maybe it was Ross Tucker might have put out when he saw that line. Um, I, I guess I shouldn't put that on if I don't know 100% it was him, but it's just not a line with a lot of accolades. So I'm still very nervous on what that line can be and how well it can protect Justin Fields.